I want to share a few, a few words here. Uh, this morning I will be talking on our relation as Christians to earthly authority, specifically the, the government or the rulers we have, earthly rulers we have over us. Um, I think the Bible, I know the Bible has quite a bit to say on this. Uh, if Peter, if Paul says one thing and Peter says the same thing, and the life of Jesus bears out, bears, bears out what these two men and other writers in Scripture have said on how we relate to earthly authorities. I think it's good that we listen, we observe, we perceive the mind of Christ in this matter and to submit to what the Holy Spirit would have us do in this matter. This appears to, an issue, to be an issue of, uh, of controversy, not just now. It's been so for generations before you and I. But I don't think it ought to be that way. Again, I think if we would hear what the Holy Spirit has said to us through, through the apostles and also especially through the life of Jesus, how Jesus reacted when he was on earth, how we dealt with earth, earthly authority while he was on earth, I think we can have a restful mind in this matter. And I pray the Holy Spirit would help us, each one, to go back and think through what he would have us here this morning. Before I, I launch into that, uh, that matter here, I want to say a few things uh, when it comes to, you know, when we read in Scripture and, in our, and hear in God's Word. In James 1, chapter, 21, uh, chapter 1, verse 21, it says there that we should receive the engrafted Word of God with meekness, with humility, with meekness, because that is that word, word which is able to save our souls. Receive God's word with meekness. The engrafted word with meekness because it's that word which is still able to save our souls. And I've always thought on that verse because he was writing to Christians who are already saved. But he's still telling them when you come to God's word, make sure you come with a humble heart. Meekness. Because that word is still able to continue to save you uh, on and on until the day you die. So I want to encourage us each, as we go to scripture, as we hear uh, messages, and especially as we go to the Bible, as we've heard many times here, you must go as a child, as a babe. Come before the Lord and say, I'm ignorant. I say that I don't know anything when it comes to spiritual matter. My natural mind wants to go one way, but God's ways are complete, completely contrary to the, the way of the natural man. And so when I come to the scripture, I must come as a babe. You remember in Matthew eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus says there that God reveals his mysteries and his truth to those who come as babes. Why am I saying this? There's so many uh, preconceived notions that we have uh, when we come to the scripture, to the Bible or to God's word, it's good that we set this aside and hear what God would say to each one of us. The tradition, remember Peter said once in 1 Peter 1 that uh, Christ, we've been saved from the traditions we received from our fathers. Each one of us, we're born and we still have biases. Certainly the natural man has those biases. The flesh has those biases and always the flesh is always contrary to God. If we do not set aside the biases we have, we may open the Bible and find whatever we want to find. I heard it said once, more than once actually, that, that we can justify anything, including any sin, if we want to, in the Bible. Is it uh, murder? Is it lying? Is it even adultery? An insincere mind can open the scriptures, this Bible, and find a justification for that sin. I think I could do it also. If you hear any sin, I can tell you, David, or somebody said this, and, and in a foolish way, justify that sin. An insincere man will always go to the Bible. He has a preconceived notion in his mind, and he just opens the scripture to justify or to buttress whatever notion he wants to justify. Let us not do that. Let us open God's word, not just to read the letter, but to pursue the spirit of what the Holy Spirit has put in this book for us to see. 
you can justify anything, any sin <laughs> in the Bible if you want to. But an honest heart will say, no, I want to hear what God has to say to me and I want to submit to that thing. I want to encourage us to do this in this matter of what I want to speak on this morning. We must come with humility. Humility and meekness is very critical. In fact, the Bible more than one, Peter, you remember in 1 Peter 3.15 says that we should be ready to give a reason for the hope we have. But we must do it how? In meekness, in fear, he says there. Even when we know the truth, uh, in sharing it, in talking about it, meekness is very important. I found that to be the key in, in, in the life of a believer, especially when it comes to God's word, in reading it for myself and even in sharing it with others. I don't, I don't try to ram thin, anything down anyone's throat, but if God would allow me, it has to be done in meekness. Paul in 2 Timothy 2, 24 says that a servant of God must not strive, must not be contentious, but must be gentle unto all men in meekness instructing those who have been captured by the devil. Meekness, remember that word as you hear God's word all the time and especially as you go to scripture. I must come as a babe and I must not come with any preconceived notion. Set those aside. Hear what the spirit of God has to say to you and to me. Meekness and humility, very critical. I always think of what, you know, in Acts 17 when it speaks of the Berean church, it says of them that they were more noble than the Thessalonican Christians. But it says there in Acts 17 that they received Paul's word, but they did go back and search, right? They received the words of Paul, uh, Acts 17 verse 11. They received the words of Paul, but they went back to search the scripture, scriptures daily to see that the things that Paul said were so. We also must have that mind. But as a, if you, I, I, when I look at how they did, did what they did, they didn't go back to search to try to find something to contradict Paul, which is another way we can go back and we hear something, and immediately there's something in our heart that says, I disagree with what that man has said, and I'm going to go to the Bible and find. These folks didn't do that. It says they received Paul's word and went to search with a mind to say, Lord, Confirm to me if what this man is saying is true, not a critical mindset, which we often have sometimes. I want to go back and challenge what that man has said, rather than submit to scripture and say, Lord, are these things so? Have I been wrong all along, the way we've been living as Bereans, and this man has come to our town to tell us something new. They didn't have a critical mind to go puncture everything Paul had said. But they had the mind to say, okay, this is a new thing we've never heard before. Lord, show us. Let us, if it's true, confirm it in our hearts and give us the strength to submit to what this man is saying, this Paul is saying. I'm just saying to you and me, brothers and sisters, that we ought to have that mind also. When we hear a godly person speak, or even again as we read scripture, don't go with the mind to say, you know, I, hear, I used to say this myself, I disagree with so and so. I say that less and less now, almost never now actually. I'd say, I don't see it. <laughs> I don't see what that person is saying, but I'm praying that God, if what that person is saying is true, Jesus confirm it to me. So I'm just encouraging us as we read scripture, hear God's word, have a mind, a mixed spirit. You might be wrong in the way you've been doing it for 50 years, for 30 years, and God may want to show us a different way. I'll close, I'll, before I, I continue here, there's a verse that always touches me in Paul's interaction with Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, Paul says this to Timothy. If there are things that you don't understand, you know, in, in, with all that I'm saying, there's still areas of, of lack of understanding, God will show this to you. And I was, I'm always so impressed when I read that, that Paul would even allow that there are some things, great Paul speaking to Timothy, whom he had great confidence in, Paul will say to him, said to him there, 1 Timothy 3.15, uh, no, not, not 1 Timothy 3.15, what was that? Um, let me see here, 1 Timothy, I know it wasn't Timothy, 
Um, I'll find it before we flizz here. There's a verse where Paul says to Timothy, if there's areas where there is a still a lack of uh, understanding, God will show this to you and make it clear to you. I'll find it before I, I finish here. The point I, I, I was, I'm trying to pull out of that verse is this, and if anyone knows where I'm talking about, please sh show it to me. That even Paul gave room to Timothy and said, if there are things that, that you don't see yet, his prayer, no, he said that to the Philippians, sorry. Philippians chapter 3, verse 15, I think it is. Right, Philippians 3, 15. Paul, writing to the Philippians, says to them there, let us be, uh, as many of us that are perfect, let us mind the same things. But if there is any area where we don't agree, where you don't understand something, God will reveal this to you. Nevertheless, in the areas where we have unity, let us walk with the same mind in those things. So the point I'm trying to make here is even Paul gave room to the uh, Philippians. There, you may not understand everything I'm telling you, but have that open mind so that God can speak to you. And ultimately, you might uh, grasp what I'm saying to you. But in the areas where we have agreement, in areas where we have agreement in living a godly life in Christ and so forth, let us walk in unity there. So I just mentioned, that's a quick preface as I, as I begin to speak here on this matter of how we deal, how we interact, how we relate to earthly authority and the government which we're under, the governments we're under. The first thing I'd like to mention in this matter is this, that God is a God of order. God is a God of order. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33, says there that God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in the churches. God is a God of order and not of confusion. And verse 40 of that same chapter, 1 Corinthians 40, 14, it says, let all things be done in, uh, decently and in order. God is not a God of order. Why am I saying that? From the beginning of time, God has set things in motion to prevent chaos on the earth. And one of those things God has allowed on this earth is rulership and leadership by men. They don't even have to be godly men, but kings, presidents, rulers, queens, in different parts of the world. It's been like that from the beginning, starting with Adam. Adam, whom God put in a garden, to care for that garden, lest the garden, uh, the garden become wild, the Garden of Eden, that is, before, become wild. God put Adam there, Adam there to care for it and place it in order, put some order there. You remember it says when the animals came to him, God allowed him to name each animal. And whatever name he gave to that animal, the Bible says that was the name the animal took. So God is not a God of confusion. From the beginning, he has set things in motion to prevent chaos starting with our Adam. And I say again that God has allowed that there should be kings and queens and uh, prime ministers and presidents and leaders in all these nations from the beginning all the way to this hour. We must uh, submit to that. And I'm not speaking of the church yet. And even in the church, speaking of order again, God has allowed uh, different uh, lead, uh, leadership in the church, elders in the church, apostles, evangelists. That's been the case all of, since the New Testament till this hour. It's what God has said. We must submit to it. Hear what, it, uh, what he has put in place. It's not a matter of that I like it, I don't like it, I don't like this president or that person. God has set leadership and order in the church and also in the world. And in the world, uh, it, it doesn't have to be a man who believes in Christ or, or is a Christian or anything like that. But God has allowed that man to take leadership. And we must agree or accept that that's his way. Even in universe, in the universe, the space, order, order, order. In the church, clearly, the order is now uh, in, in, uh, in, with Christ as the head and everyone under that, uh, in that leadership submitting to Jesus Christ as head. But in the world, it need not be so. God has allowed it. I don't know why. 
but I must submit to that. So let's remember that first of all, God is a God of order and he has allowed us as human beings to have leaders in the, in the, in the, in, uh, in the earth over us. The next thing I want to say also is that in spite of the fact that God has allowed order and leadership in, in the world, he is still in control of all things. Very important for us to remember that. Lest we be fret and be afraid and confused and Jesus Christ, God ultimately is still above all. God is still the, 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 the reason why the Bible refers to Jesus as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The world does not see that yet, but it doesn't take away the fact that he is still the Lord of Lords. He is the King of all Kings. Very important for us to rest in this as believers or else again, we're going to get into all types of unnecessary worry or debate or arguments and all that. Jesus, God is still, is still atop all the leaders in the world. There's a verse in Isaiah 40 that says that he is the one who sits atop the circle of the earth. God is in charge. I, want, I hope you can just lay that to heart now. He is still in charge. He is still the ruler. He has allowed this earthly looter, uh, leaders for a season to have what appears to be control, but the final say still belongs to God. There are many verses in the Bible that speak to this matter. Uh, I'll give you a few here. Um, many of them, many of them. In 1 Samuel, uh, one of the verses I like uh, in 1 Samuel where, uh, where Anna, 1 Samuel chapter 2, Anna there says, First uh, Samuel 2, in verse, verse 8, First Samuel 2, verse 8, it's the end of that verse says, the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. In other words, God has placed, he's still in control. Many other verses in Daniel, you see the same thing, Daniel chapter 2, he says there that God is the one who, let's look at that one verse, He's the one who's still in control and puts leaders in and takes them out. I've read that verse many times. Whenever I start to get agitated by what one leader is doing or one, one, what one person, one governor or someone is saying something, or governor or one leader is saying, I go to this verse many, many times. In Daniel chapter 2, in verse 21, it says there that God is the one who changes the times and seasons. He removes kings and he sets them up again. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge, knowledge to them that know understanding. I hope you can just settle this in your mind. Very, very important. This must be the foundation of our minds when we think of leaders and governors and queens and kings. These people will appear to have great power on the earth. You must know that God is still the one who can put them, who put them there and is able to take them away like that. God is in control of all things. Let me give you one last verse, which I like a lot. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, it says this of Jesus. Revelation 11, verse 15. Towards the end of that verse, or the middle of that verse, it says, One day, right now it's not that the case, but one day the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord Jesus Christ. And our Lord and his Christ, and it shall reign forever and ever and ever. Amen. One day that is going to happen. Right now the world has, an, has not accepted Jesus as king. But one day everything will be turned over to him. To God and his Christ. And that Christ and our God will reign forever on this earth. I'm saying this to you to just find, find some rest and comfort in these things I'm reading. There are many verses I could go on with some other verses like that that show that God is still in control. Do not be moved with any one person, any one leader, any one ruler, they're man. One of these days, they'll be gone as well. God will put someone else in their place. But there is one who is unchangeable, that is God himself and our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. I'm just sharing a few things 
when I start to get, uh, there's a temptation to be afraid, this man has said such and such, this ruler says such and such, he's threatening this, or I go back to some of those verses I read to you. God is in control of all things. That man is a man. That woman is a woman. That queen or that king, he's just talking. His time will be over soon, and God will put someone else in. But when it's all said and done, our Father is still in control of all things. And our brother, Jesus Christ, he is still the king of kings. That's a very important phrase. There are kings everywhere, but there's one that, that tops them all, the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember that. I'm sharing a few things that bring rest to me. When I see all those things in the news all over the world, Jesus Christ, my king, he reigns. He reigns even still in the affairs of man. Certainly he must reign in my heart, first of all. So I wanted to mention though, so in terms of our responsibility to this government, to these rulers that God has placed on the earth, again, I'm, I'm saying to you, they don't have to be Christian. God allows many unbelievers to be kings and queens. He allows them to come there. How are we to relate to them? I want to give you a few scriptures here. Go back and read them. And I'm saying this because I begin by saying you can find anything in the Bible to justify whatever you want to justify. And as I begin to read some of these verses to you, there's an instinct in our, in our hearts, especially if we've held certain beliefs, that says, no, I'm not, that's not, I don't want to do that. As a rebellious spirit in all our hearts. But as I begin with, we must come to God's word with meekness and humility and hear what God himself will say to us. What, how are we to relate to this government and this, or the government of the earth? And I'm going to close by, show, uh, as I speak, show you examples of the life of Jesus himself. Uh, how he related to some of those governments or the rulers that were over him. Imagine Jesus Christ, this king of kings I mentioned to you. He came as a lowly man and he himself submitted. If Jesus would do that, how much more you and me? I hope the Lord will help us see this. The first responsibility, I believe, to earthly authority is to obey them. See, that thing will well up as obey, obey every government, obey every ruler. The scripture says obey them, right? But the thing I've heard from many, even Christians, will say, what about in Acts 5? Paul, uh, Peter says, we're, not able, we're only supposed to obey God, Acts 5, 29. We're to be obey God and not the, the Jewish rulers. Peter was saying that. Okay, he did say that. But the same Peter in 1 Peter 2 says to obey all authority. Which one is right? Peter that says we must obey God and not you guys in the, the Jewish uh, leaders. Or the Peter in 1 Peter 2 verse 13. You see that yourself. It says to submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Whether they be kings or those who are supreme or governors. For they're sent by God to punish evil doers and so forth. So which one is right? Peter in Acts 5.29 that says we must obey God and not these rulers. Or Peter here in 1 Peter 2 that says we must submit to governors and rulers and so forth. It's still the same thing he's saying. It's still the same Peter filled by the Holy Spirit who said what he said there and wrote this. There's no contradiction. We must obey those who have authority to us in as far as their requirements do not lead us or require us to sin against God's word, what God has said. If their commandments contravene, directly contravene God's word, certainly we must not obey that. So in Acts 5, they had told Peter and the apostles, you must not speak in the name of Jesus. How can we do that as Christians? We can't follow that. Think of the uh, Hebrew, Hebrew boys in Daniel. They had been told to bow down to a statue. How can we as Christians who have one king bow down to any other king, any other statue on this earth? We can't do that. But in matters of civil matters, legal matters, things, paying taxes, the Bible says, things that are required for our earthly existence, the scripture says obey them. And the truth is that many of the laws, certainly in this country, are, are decent laws. They're not, they're not laws that lead us to directly, contra, uh, directly disobey God's commandments. Paying our, our taxes, obeying street, uh, street or driving laws and 
You can name them. They're decent laws. Even if I disagree with those laws, the Bible says obey it. If it does not directly lead you to contravene God's word. And as I say, I've observed, I've been living here for several years now. The laws, in my opinion, are decent. I may not agree with them. For example, taxes. I don't want to pay so much in taxes. I, you want to? No, I don't. Nobody wants to pay taxes. But the Bible says pay it. So it's not a question whether I agree or disagree. Paying my taxes does not directly contravene God's law in any way. I have no problem with it, even though I don't enjoy paying it. So many of the sort of laws that people argue over, if it does not contravene, directly contravene God's word, just do what the Bible says. Obey it, and obey it for conscience sake, even if you disagree with it. That's one verse. Look at what Paul says in, in Titus chapter 3 also. Titus chapter 3, Paul says there in verse 1, Titus 3, 1, saying to, the, uh, to put the saints in mind to be subject to the leaders and powers to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. And to speak evil, verse 2 says, to speak evil of no man and so forth. Put it in mind that they should obey those in authority. I think this is very important. Again, if the Bible didn't talk about these things, there's no need for us to stand here and speak on them. But the Holy Spirit put it in mind for Peter to take several verses, and for Paul in several verses, especially in Romans 13, to speak on this matter. We can't just slough over it and slide over it like that. We have to consider it. And hear what the Spirit is saying again. Put it, them in mind to obey. And as you know, Paul, at this time they were writing, he was writing these things when they had a very terrible real, uh, ruler in Nero, in, in Rome at that time. So if the requirement is to pay taxes, Paul says pay your taxes. If the requirement is to honor, and honor all men and certainly honor these people, we do it. It doesn't take away anything for me obeying God's word. In fact, God's word is for me to do those things. It's strange, but it's so. Again, Peter would say is not to listen to the rulers uh, in, 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 uh, in, in those days of the Jewish rulers because their words contravene God's, uh, uh, God's commandment. Says in 1 Peter 2, obey them. Obey them. I want this to be, to us to remember this and ask the Holy Spirit to help us in this matter. Lest we argue and fight over little things that distract us. I see that all the time. Believers, what we should be fighting against. You know, the Bible says uh, our enemies are not earthly people. But the devil loves to get us arguing over earthly things. Right? In 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 4, Paul says there that though we're in the world... We're not of the world, and the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal. They're not earthly, but they're mighty unto God for the pulling down of strongholds, and so forth and so forth. We're not fighting a, an earthly battle. Believers have love forgotten this. You cannot win the devil with earthly tactics. Never. He knows that you're not going to win by arguing by this, and you're not going to win that. Though we're in the world, the weapons of our warfare, they're not earthly. They're not carnal. They're spiritual. We're in a spiritual battle, brothers and sisters. Ephesians 6 says that. Right? We war not against, the, against flesh and blood. Principalities, powers, rulers, and dark places. That's what we're dealing with, brothers and sisters. And the devil has having a field day, having watching Christians just getting into all these earthly battles. It must not be. So let us keep our eyes on what really matters. Our own flesh. I said to someone the other day, I'm fighting my own flesh every day. I, I do I have time to argue over many of these external things? There's a battle raging in my own life. There's a battle raging in, uh, with, against the church of Jesus Christ. Satan is at work. Let us be wise. The Bible in 2 Corinthians 2 says, we must not be ignorant of his devices. So the scripture says to obey them. It's not worth debating over simple things that do not directly contravene God's word. If it's a matter of sin, you remember with Daniel, he was told not to pray. How can we do that? No, Daniel says, I have to pray because that directly 
contradicts my responsibilities towards my maker, that we must. But if it meant Daniel, Daniel serving in, in, the, in the king's court and doing his duties, maybe even collecting taxes or whatever, making sure the people are subject to Nebuchadnezzar of all kings, he did it. That does not directly uh, prevent him from serving and worshiping God as he must. I hope we can remember this. Obey them, the Bible says. Think of what, you know the story well in Matthew 22, when the Jews came to Jesus, should we pay taxes? He said that to them, give me that coin. Whose face is on there? Give to Caesar what is his. Give to God what is God. God is not worried, he's not, uh, he's, not, he's not greedy to want what is Caesar's. No, just give God what is his and give to Caesar what is his. Another story in Matthew 17, which I like very much, it's come to new light to me. You know when the, the, the folks came to Peter and asked him, does your master pay taxes? See what Jesus says there. What a, I've gotten more light on, on his statements of Christ and the events in that story. Matthew 17, starting from verse 24. When they came to, Jesus, to Peter and asked, does your master not pay taxes? Peter in verse 25 says, yes. And Jesus pulls him aside when he comes into the house. And Jesus asked him some question. I've thought on this question. Many times. Jesus says to Simon, what do you think? Do the kings of the earth take a custom or tax a tribute of their own children or strangers? Peter says to him, of strangers. They take it from strangers. And Jesus said to him, then are the children, you're right, then are the children free. Verse 27, notwithstanding, so that we don't offend them. Go to the sea, the first, fi uh, the first fish you catch, there's a coin there, take that coin and pay our taxes. Do you see what Jesus is saying there? Really, Jesus ought not to be paying taxes. He is the king of kings, but so as not to, uh, I'm still subject to the requirements in, in Capernaum and in, in Israel in those days to pay taxes to the Romans. Go ahead, Peter, pay. Even though in reality, he ought not to have been paying the taxes, but Again, not to offend them, he says there. This is not something we're going to argue about, Peter. If it's a requirement in the land, go ahead and pay. And more importantly, I see from that event that God will provide everything I need to comply. Even if it's taxes or whatever it might be, God will provide. That's what this verse, this story means to me. I don't need to argue or be angry. or God will take care of all that and provide whatever I need. To comply with those rules. Again, if those rules do not contravene God's commandments, the Bible says to obey, even if you disagree. And in this story here, Jesus ought not to be paying taxes, but he still did. He still did. That's an example for us. If it was a matter of Jesus not preaching God's word or worshiping his father, obviously he would have, he would have stood against that. I just give you that example to think on. So obey them. What else, how else are we to relate to authorities? Another one we've heard of many times from 1 Timothy 2 is to pray for these people. Pray for our leaders, the, Christ, the believers and the unbelievers alike. 1 Timothy 2 verse 1. It says there, first of all, when I see that, I pause there. So first of all, that means this is very important Paul is saying there. First of all, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, supplications, prayer, intercession, and giving of thanks. Four things there. A lot of times we talk about just prayer. But the Bible says you supplicate, intercede. Have you ever done that? To intercede for your governor, for your president, for your county, wherever it might be. Intercede for them and give thanks how can I give thanks, Paul? How could you give thanks for Nero? <laughs> Scripture says to give thanks. Give thanks. It's the command of the Bible. Give thanks for them because God's ways are different from ours. That man who appears to be wicked, he's still furthering the work of God. I can give thanks for that even though right now it appears he's doing an evil thing and he is doing an evil thing, but God's will will still be done at last. Remember this, everything on this earth is working towards a conclusion. And that conclusion is still the crowning and the rulership of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing will thwart that. No human being, no demons, nothing. 
Jesus Christ will be crowned. He is Lord of Lords, and that crown will be revealed to all men. God is still atop of all things. I can give thanks for that. Give thanks, it says there. I'm pointing this out because many times we forget to do this. Not just prayer, it says there. Intercede and supplicate and give thanks. If you are not doing these things, you are sinning. It's the truth. God has put it there. We must obey it. Obey it. See what uh, Samuel says in 1 Samuel chapter 12. Samuel in 1 chapter 12, in praying for the Jews, he says there that if I forget to pray for you, I'll be sinning. You know, we hear that verse a lot in James 4, 17. It says, uh, if we know the right thing to do, we don't do it, it is sin. And here in 1 Samuel chapter 12, see what Samuel says. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 23. After talking to the Israelites, very rebellious people, Samuel says this to them. God forbid, 1 Samuel 15, 23, uh, 12, 23. God forbid that I should sin against him in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and right way. What am I saying here? If the scripture says we ought to pray for our leaders, give thanks for them, supplicate and intercede for them, and we don't do it, you're sinning. Now, if you didn't know till now, God overlooks that. But now that we know, and I think we've heard this many times, certainly in this church, that we ought to give thanks. And pray for our leaders. Pray for them, intercede for them, and supplicate for them. And why should we do that? It tells us in that, in that uh, chapter as well. First Timothy 2. What are we to pray for uh, on behalf of our leaders? First Timothy 2, uh, verse 1 and 2. Pray for the kings and for all that are in authority, verse 2. That we might lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So we pray that God, like uh, I hear Santos say it many times, honestly, that we may continue, he said it this, evening, this morning too, that we may have time to continue to live uh, a, a peaceable life where we can serve Jesus more and more. Because there might be a time when the fire gets hotter. We're praying God extend that time before the fire gets hotter and it becomes harder and harder to serve Jesus. Pray that God may allow that through those leaders more and more. And also... In verse, um, in verse 4, in continuing the same statement by Paul, it says in verse 4 that God will have all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Still in continuation, pray that some of these folks who don't know the Lord, that God will uh, make a visitation to these people, and they also may repent and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Most of them probably will not, but there might be that one leader that you've been praying for. I do it. Most of them will not, but there might be that one person. God visits him in a dream with someone coming to him. And without you knowing, that man may give his life to Jesus. So pray also that they may come to the knowledge of the truth. God does not want any man to perish. It's not his will. Second Peter 3 says that God desires that all should come to repentance. All men, no matter how wicked that man is, God does not win, want anyone to die in sin. And so, two things you can start with. Supplication, intercession, uh, 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 thanksgiving. And also, praying that these people will come to know the Lord Jesus. This is God's mind. That they will come to know the Lord. So, pray for them. I said earlier to obey them. And very importantly, pray for them. Pray for the ones who are doing things against what you would desire, who are doing things against the church, pray for that man. Don't just pray for those that you like in this. Pray for them all. The Bible does not distinguish in this chapter, in this verses here. So obey them. Pray for them. Supplicate. Intercede for them. Intercession is more than just, I pray one minute, that this man is in my heart and praying for him. Especially those that I disagree with that they may come to know the Lord Jesus also. I believe God will answer that prayer. I believe it for myself. They may not accept when God visits them or speaks the word to them, but I believe God answers my prayer. Like, Jesus, visit such and such, please. Come to him somehow. Whether that man accepts the word of God or not, it's a different matter. 
but pray that Jesus, the word of God, also may come to that man, that ruler. The, thought, the third thing I want to mention here is something we ought not to do, we should not be doing when it comes to our leaders. It's speaking evil of them. Speaking evil of our leaders. This is quite a sport amongst even Christians that we speak wrongly about our leaders. You are sinning as you do these things. You may not know it. You may think you're defending this, defending the church, defending the Bible. But if you speak evil of, of our leaders, I believe you're sinning. And I grew up in a country where uh, that is something, if you pack, if you bring several <laughs> folks from my country together, within five minutes, I guarantee it, the next hour would be what that corrupt president had done. Cover. I'm telling you the truth. It happens all the, almost 99% of the time. I don't know about here, but it, and I think it's getting that way even in America. But where I grew up, put them together. It's about that corrupt leader, that crazy leader, that idiot, that this and that. And they all say this. Christians say it, speak like that. And they don't know that they're sinning. God is grieved when we talk like this. In Titus 3, the same chapter where Paul says to obey our leaders, he says there in verse 2 that we should speak evil of no man much less our leaders. Speak evil of no man. Titus 3 verse 2. Speak evil of no man. We should be gentle, he says there. We're Christians. I disagree with that man. I disagree with what is done. But I'm not going around speaking evil of him. I'm not posting this thing about what he said or what he says there. All you're doing is feeding the flesh. And to the extent that you do these things, you're contributing to this evil of sending this video, sending that video, look at what that person, I disagree with him, but it's not for me to go around arguing and speaking ill of that man. Imagine Jesus doing that. I don't think he ever would. He would not even waste his time. Rather, if it was a man we would hear, Jesus would pray for him. Paul would do the same. Let us speak evil of no man. This, I think, is a very subtle way the devil gets us. And we're sinning many times as we disobey these things. So I just want to share, leave you with this few things, brothers and sisters. I think on them a lot. Like I said, it's controversial, but it ought not to be. If we would submit to the words of the Holy Spirit, observe the life of Jesus. Jesus was a man like you and me, and he submitted himself to earthly authority. He disagreed with many of the things they did, but again, if it was something that never directly uh, contradicted the ways of his father, he would do it. We don't need to waste our ammunition, our strength on silly debates, on silly looking at all these videos left and right. The devil is distracting us. He knows. As I said before, you're never going to win the devil with earthly means by boycotting this, by going to court, by all these sort of things. Okay, maybe right in some instances, but I see many of these instances that I know will not work. The devil, the scripture, Jesus himself called him the prince of this world. Paul calls him the god of this world. You want to fight the God of this world using worldly methods. It's not going to work. Ours is to pray. Ours is to live godly lives. Ours is to walk in humility and truth. There's a verse in Revelations, uh, Re Revelations 19, which I just saw in recent times. Speaking of Jesus, that day of the final battle. See what it says of Jesus, even in fighting that battle at last. Revelations 19, verse, verse 11 towards the end of that verse. It's quite touched me. It says that, that by in righteousness, Jesus will judge and make war. And the rest of that chapter talks about the battle that Jesus wages against the devil. It's in righteousness. It's not in one blow against the devil that the devil punches back in. It's in righteousness. The victory is ours in Christ Jesus. And we claim and, and attain that victory not by earthly means, fighting back in it's in righteousness. Even for Jesus Christ, his victory will come in righteousness. We're Christians, brothers and sisters. Let us yield to the voice of the Spirit of Christ. It's very simple for me, very, very simple. I just want to yield to the ways of the Lord. Uh, you know that memory verse for the children this morning? Let me close with that story. In the memory verse in uh, Joshua 2.11. Does anyone know who said that, made that statement? Anyone, anyone know who said that statement? Joshua 2.11. 
I don't want my kids to say because we talked about it this morning. That was Rahab. Rahab, and see what she says there. Joshua 2.11. See what she says there. I'm trying to, there's a thought that came to my mind here. See what Josh, uh, Rahab says in Joshua 2.11. Actually starting from verse 10. See what she says here. Joshua 2, I'm going to read verse 10. She says there, we have heard how the Lord dried up the water in the Red Sea, and when you came out of Egypt, what he did unto the kings of Amorites and Jordan and so forth. In other words, Rahab is saying, we heard what God did all the way from Egypt, all the way down to this hour, what he did. And that is what ultimately saves Rahab. How did this happen? Through whom did this victory come? It came through the king of Egypt, who was Pharaoh. In Romans chapter 9, God says there, Paul, the Holy Spirit through Paul through the Holy Spirit says this. Romans 9, Pharaoh was a very terrible king, wicked. You know the story very well, how he punished the Jews, the Israelites, and all that. If you were in Israel at that time, what would you have said? This is a bad man, this is a wicked king, and he was. But see what God says through Paul, and, and he says that even in Exodus. In Romans chapter 9, verse 17. The scripture says of Pharaoh, for this, God is speaking here, for this same purpose I raise you up, that I might show my power in you, through you, that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Could something good come out of Pharaoh being, doing what he did? Yes. He was one of the greatest witnesses the world has ever seen. One of the witness, greatest witnesses of God's power. It says that in all the earth, I believe that. That even through Rome, uh, Pharaoh's wickedness, Rahab got to hear of God, and she was saved. What am I saying here? You might sit back and think that man, how could God allow that man to be lead president or queen or king? You don't know. But maybe through that man, another person somewhere else, through his action, the witness of Jesus Christ may come to that man. It happened through Pharaoh. So what am I saying? Our minds are so limited. God's ways are not our ways. God's under, he, the way he does things are beyond our own understanding. Let us rest and obey what the Bible says. Let, leave the outcome to the Lord. He knows what he's doing. He has allowed that man to come. As wicked as he is, God allowed him to be the leader of the country, of the town, of the governor, of the state, of the queen, of the kingdom. Leave that to the Lord. But through that man's action, Jesus' name will still be glorified one way or the other. Rahab got saved through Pharaoh. That's the point I'm trying to make through that event. So let's be careful. Let us think through these things. Romans 13 is a very, very powerful chapter that talks about all these matters I've spoken to you on. In that chapter, more than once, at least three times, Paul says the leaders of our, our leaders are ministers of God. How can that man be a minister? How could Pharaoh be a minister of God? The Bible says so. Minister meaning an instrument of God. God is using him to bring about his purposes. And it says in Romans 13 that if you disobey or, or rebel against this leadership, you are heaping damnation on yourself, judgment. Let me read that verse and close here. When I saw that <laughs> damnation is for sinners, it's for wicked people. Paul is saying here, if you rebel against this leadership that God has put there, Romans 13 verse 2. Whoever resists the power resists the order, resists the authority of people that God has allowed. You're resisting God's ordinance. And by resisting, you shall receive on yourself damnation. Some versions say judgment. I take that seriously. We may think it's a light thing to make fun and, and diss all this, and make, speak ill of these people. Disagree with them if you want to. Vote against them if you want to. But do not speak evil of of any man do not speak evil of leaders do not post this and post that you're enhancing the work of the devil by doing these things pray for them obey the laws of the land if it doesn't contravene the, uh, the word of God obey them never speak evil of them may God help us to understand this thing I've found this is a trick of the devil in this hour he's been doing it for generations let us be wise and not fall for this trap let's we sin without we realizing it. May God help us. Amen.